Thanks for coming. My name is Priyatam. I'm a writer and a software engineer. First, I'd like to thank uh, Cognitect and Alex. Uh, I'm a new Clojure developer. When I sent, I didn't know I was going to be accepted, so they accepted. I'm really happy. My brother and I have been working uh, on a project for the last nine months. Uh, I quit my job. And uh, we've been doing Clojure for the last four or five months. And uh, really excited to share what we learned. And we hope to get some feedback. So when I write, I write organically. Uh, most of my friends, uh, they write organically as well. And so are my teachers. So when I sat back and thought about Clojure, I didn't understand what this meant in programming. So I set that up as a goal. How do you build organic software? But first, the problem. Specific to the topic, poem is value. It's publishing. So when you look at publishing, this is where we are. We have content, your CMS, and there are about a dozen formats and another dozen more formats. And then you have to merge design with the front end if you have the money. If you don't, then you go just use the formats that you have and then somehow put the e EPUB or a PDF on the browser. But if you have money, you'll go with the front end design team or not if you have an, you have an Android team. But what about data? The ideal workflow for agencies I worked for over a decade is something like this, except most agencies focus on design, publishers focus on content, and engineers like us focus on data. How do we work together? But here's a real problem, and that's the topic of uh, my talk, is poem is a value. How do you curate thousands, perhaps a few million poems from the public domain? Books are pages, clauses, phrases, Sentences, similes, metaphors, they're not strings. This is the state of books today. My room roughly looks like this. There are a lot of bookstores that are being closed. And this is beyond the one million poems online somewhere that deep. There are more millions like these archived. This is what you get in libraries. Big libraries in the country have Walt Whitman poems manuscripted like these several hundreds of them. This is the best public domain site today. We can't interact with them. And I want to show what interaction means for a minute. So I have a poem here. I wrote a couple of notes. And let's say I need a volunteer from here. I'm going to pick a gentleman in the front. I want to share these notes with you. Go ahead. I have a roomy poem. I want to share the notes with you. So the idea is, this is what we do in writing classes. We write notes. We just don't tear them. Well, let's try that. Let's see what that means. If I tear these notes and give it to you, here you go. And someone else asks me, what's your notes? I can't do that. We can't do that in real life. Now, I used to be a proud Java engineer, you know. Java certified, design patterns, and all that stuff, scripting languages. I started learning Clojure. I passed out. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. Now, I keep coming back to some quotes I've written. And the quotes always remind me of something. And this is one of the quotes uh, I actually studied uh, in a workshop with uh, several people. And she's one of them. She's a great poet uh, and a great book on poetry, I have a reference of that at the end. Every good poem asks a question, and every good poet asks a question. So I asked myself, what do I want to build with public domain poetry? Start with the page. Forget the book. No CMS, no frameworks, no MEC, no buttons, no menus, no forms. Just the page and the poem. I'd like to show you a demo. We built a browser REPL for poets. It's just a start. There are bugs, I apologize. <laughs> Has anyone here uh, worked with IA Writer, the Markdown editor? I love that. It's an amazing piece of software. 
It's the best, for those who don't know, it's the best markdown editor for Macs. So this is my design inspiration for that. What you see is a simple poem, Sappho, it's a Greek poem, uh, and this is the poem. You see the metadata, you see the tags. What's happening behind the scenes, this is an ohm, there are three ohm components here. The, this is the poem that is rendered with data structures internally with a tokenization and a fre frequency word count. The metadata are rendered using mustache, which again, the data is coming from an elastic search engine. And now, I promised about interacting with the page. The search. What just happened was a REPL component was built with Ohm, and there's a custom S expression that is being converted into that command, and a command is dispatched in code async. Went to Elasticsearch, came back with the results, and it just loaded on the page. Now, I just gave this gentleman a couple of pages torn notes, right? I asked the question, we can't do that in software, so I wanted to find out how we could do it. So one of the ways we could do it, we'll just say note, but before that, we need to escape into another mode, like, rep, like Emacs. I just say escape, and there's the command line, and I say note. Well, I want to note the first line, first word, the first line, third word. Subtle is the path. I like that word, right? First, fourth, I just highlighted. What just happened was Ohm re-rendered that component. Node just dispatched what happened into a channel. That channel sent the event to the poem, which is a root, and the poem rendered the note on its using a jQuery plugin, which we just used. So, but that's all happening behind the scenes. But now I want to add some notes uh, on the note, saying that, well, the lover is never slow, and I'm not sure what that means, right? So it's really hard if you have a long poem, so I'm going to go and figure out, OK, that's a 5-1, which means it's the fifth time that the word is repeated, 5-4. So let's see what that means. So imagine you're doing this in a, in a classroom, public, public school, and the teacher is teaching this. This is probably what he would do. The note is highlighted on the right. You can keep doing this. There are notes, many other notes, for example. I can do a note. Uh, just like that, and the first one is highlighted. Now here's a question. Can anyone suggest how do we share this with someone? the same way I shared a torn paper with that gentleman out there. I've done three interactions. It's a front end app. I've made highlights, but I made it in a specific order. If I'm a teacher in a classroom with 15 to 20 students, that's typical. I share these notes with them, and then I give the homework. But I want to share them online. How do I do it? Anyone? Any suggestions? But if I share the link, I want to share a link, right? on Twitter or, or an email. If I share the link, I'll probably get a page, you know, the fall ways to put the page and show all the highlights, but I want to show it interactively, step by step, the same exact way I did it as a teacher, for example. Sorry? But, it, but we would not be able to see all the highlights. Well, yeah, anyone else? Mm -hmm. But what if we can do it better? If you work with Ohm, one of the things that does is it gives you a record and play. So let's try that. Let me see if there's something called play. Apparently there is. I'm just going to move my right arrow. Another one. Another one. And it circles. This entire thing is stored as an annotation in Eden. 
Right now, the only uh, missing component, the sync with Datomic, isn't working, uh, but it's actually stored as Eden, so this can be dispatched to a backend server and can be saved. You can save it. I will show you in a bit. The entire note saved as is. Imagine you are doing more of these notes and you have a page. You can generate a URL and you can share. And that was one of our requirements since one of my business partners is a, is a poet and a teacher and he'd like to do, teach poetry in public schools. Now, with linguistics, things get even more interesting. Um, you get nouns and verbs, things like, you want to see nouns, you can see nouns. This is fairly simple. What just happened, again, is I'm using a Python library, uh, NLTK library. There are about six libraries having a REST server behind the scenes, and that's actually sending, opened up as a REST API, and then that's connected to the command in the REPL, and it's sending it back. Uh, but all that is happening behind the scenes. We can add more commands, any more, uh, more, more NLTK commands if you want, but it will, it's just a matter of adding one extra step in the UI. Nothing else changes. So this is what we built so far, is having a page and interacting with the page without leaving it. And if you want to change, uh, you can switch your context. For example, search. I want to search now. I'll simply say search. And we'll start looking for, uh, let's look at Chris Granger's, uh, Granger's uh, IDE as value. It's not a poem, but I like it. It's, it's a really good uh, essay. So I'm going to come in a, uh, I'm going to come back to this in a bit. Uh, how this was happened? How this happened? Because initially it designed it for poetry, but the data format allows it to in, to put any other content type, and we'll get that get to that in a bit. I want to get back to the presentation a bit. I want to talk about um, what inspired me for what inspired us to do that design. And uh, I, I, I kept reading Light Table, Ohm, and Datomic Docs over and over again. I'm still trying to understand. And uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote a simple thing, and I want to share it with you. Uh, it goes back to the question before, as if you notice, what is the, uh, how do you, every good poem asks a question. So I wanted to format it in that way. And this is what I came across. How do you contextualize a runtime engine with near infinite customizations? The answer I found was think in data, build a foundation on data, make a platform to adapt and grow in ways you couldn't have thought in the beginning. And with Ohm, and I'm still learning Ohm, uh, it's fascinating. It's the best thing I've seen uh, in ClojureScript. It actually convinced me that I should learn ClojureScript. This is what I believe. David perhaps is thinking, <laughs> how do you re-render thousands of UI components with record and play? Ohm, record interactions in DOM with atoms for Eden, for local and shared states, create cursors with live path refs, view data pointing to application state, follow protocols, and optionally sync them with server for playback. And the datomic. How do you record memories? Store a collection of facts that do not change. Add new facts like memory, superseding old facts over time. Build a snapshot of facts that collective knowledge over time, that collect knowledge over time to reveal meaning. So that's what we found, and I want to go through the architecture. Uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, poets and teachers, uh, I've been reading his books, uh, Richard Hugo, and he says this, if you were to choose between being eclectic and various or being repetitious and boring, be repetitious and boring. Most good poets are, if read for a very long time in one setting, Richard Hugo. Uh, our history, as I mentioned earlier, we've been working on this for nine months. We started off with a Python Flask app. Then we switched to Node Express with Meteor since we wanted real-time interaction. 
And then we, we wrote our own little static site generator in Python, SamiJS, and six months later, this is what we have. <coughs> Content design data in their own workflows. And let, we have a new, we have a mark, plain text markup format called Zenup. Uh, it's just plain text and YAML in the front end. If you worked in Jekyll, it's exactly that. Um, and the content is stored in Elasticsearch for search in pure JSON. And for data, we have Eden. Um, there is an Eden format called Zen, which is simply Eden with our own Eden readers. Um, since our content, which goes in Ohm, is highly contextualized and there's data structures in it, so we had to write our own reader. Uh, right now, it's straight, straightforward, but we want to expand that. And there's a linguistics component in Python. Um, and then I just started Datomic three weeks ago, and I'm excited what I've learned. There's a small uh, example uh, I'd like to show you. And then for the design, uh, I've been fascinated by the response of web design for the past couple of years. I'm not a designer by trade, but uh, I have learned so much by reading blogs of Paul Irish and uh, some of the jQuery um, folks who've done fantastic plugins. So how does the annotations work? Going back to that page, what you saw as a REPL was actually an annotation. This was the inspiration from Light Table. Light Table says you make everything contextualized. If you remember, how many of you are familiar with Light Table's uh, bot architecture? So the way, uh, for those of you who are not, the way it works is every event is captured in a simple closure data structure, like associative data structures, keys, or vec maps, or vectors. And their events are named with keywords, and they're dispatched. Something similar, uh, not as exhaustive as light table we had, is we simply have an annotation that gets parsed as an S expression. Literally, what you saw is note 1114, and the notes was parsed as an S expression, sent back in the data structure to Eden in the back end. Commands are dispatched via core async and sent by jQuery. And poems internally are stored as data structures with tokenization and frequency counting. This is, uh, it, I would, for, if anyone wants to know what this is, I would forward you a couple of links. Uh, it's something to do with NLTK, and I'm happy to share you the code as well. How many of you are familiar with Ohm, new to Ohm, or excited about Ohm? Great, that's awesome. <laughs> well, this is what I learned. Ohm is simply a full circle of UI generating events, events generating state, and it's back. And uh, I put some, a little diagram here. Um, there are three, more, three core components in Ohm. What is the reactive UI, and one is the uh, message, uh, state management, and one is the messaging. Let's look at how the life cycle works. So you have a UI component. It's basically a giant tree. You can think of it that way. And you have a cursor uh, that and then there's a render, uh, rendering code. Rendering code is just div h1, div h2, something like hiccup if you want it. But it's simply the markup. And there are lifecycle hooks. First hook is init. And uh, you can set your state, simple atoms, Eden. And then the next is you're about to mount. Now, now this is when you are about to mount the UI component after the init. So you have, this is a good place to put a channel, initialize a channel, for example, a go loop which says, well, I'm about to put my note component, which you've seen. Uh, I will initialize a channel, which will be listening to note events. And if it gets a note event, do something. In our case, we're just highlighting that and displaying on the right side. Uh, this, is, this is a good place to put DOM event change listeners. And then, at, and then there's another state. This is a part of the life cycle. Re-render. Uh, before, after, and at render. If you look at the protocols, uh, it's, uh, it's worded slightly differently. Um, I, I feel more convenient reading this way. Uh, it'll be I, I will render an I before, something like that. And at that point, uh, you will have a cursor that points to a diff. Basic, not a diff, uh, it's a state changes. So the way you can think of cursor, uh, in, my, in my view, is if anyone has worked in get in, um, in closure script, you get a path to an associated data structure. So that's basically like having a nice live data, live pointer to the entire database, which is this tree. So in, in, imagine you have a page. You loaded some state. That's a tree. Now you have a cursor which says somewhere in that tree, this branch 
is what my component wants. So it's pointing to that life. So that's how I understand. And then you have set state and shared state. Each component can have local state and shared state. And then you simply put or get. In my case, I'm simply putting uh, on a channel. You can put anything. And I'm getting it. And there are no callbacks. And this section over here is when your page re-renders. Every time state changes, OM re-renders that particular part. So anything you put here is re-rendered. Everything happens without you making DOM manipulation. So what are the benefits? Custom repos eliminate the complex menu navigation forms. Uh, this is very useful for professional users. Uh, the one of the things I wanted to mention was when you're targeting a specific segment who, knew, who know what they want to do, who know what to search, they're more they're comfortable with something that is highly interactive, and they're OK with learning a few commands, for example. Uh, immutable data structures make DOM manipulation easy. Light table changed the way I thought about programming. It also happens to be a great IDE. Splitting content and data with Elasticsearch and Datomic has worked well. Uh, I'm still learning Datomic. It just started three weeks ago. Uh, I think we're going to put all the annotations in Datomic. And uh, Eden and Zenup make some, if not all, future content types uh, adaptable to the platform. What I mean by that is I started off this project with, with curating poetry and created a simple markup like Markdown. And then I realized that, well, you can put a blog in it as long as it sticks to that mark, Markdown format. You, if you want your own format, you can write a spec own format. And it's, it's a matter of simply writing a trans transformation. Uh, anyone Python fans here? Great. Um, I'm a great fan of this uh, Kenneth Rates. Uh, he's, he's a great Python developer. He wrote this, um, he did a bunch of presentations, Python for Humans, uh, I strongly recommend. Uh, basically, he, the notion that the API, the end user, should be simple. I tried to uh, follow his patterns and design practices. This is how our API looks like. And uh, I actually want to show it. So I'm gonna, we're going to do some live coding. Hopefully, it will work. So what you see here is a demo that I created for Clojure West. Um, I've simply imported all the code for our project. And these are the three poems that you've added. You know, it's in resources. There are Whitman poems and a few other poems. So I'm going to clean up the Elasticsearch. We'll check the status. So if we just cleaned up. We can check it over here. Just one remaining. Yeah. So, so it's a simple API and a wrapper. So if you've worked with Elasticsearch, you can see there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, I, I believe that if, if you're working with a library, um, Try to address the problem that you have in hand and write simple wrappers. That way, you have like two layers. Um, I'll show, I, I'm happy to show you the actual code in search. There's a lot of boilerplate you need to write to set up Elasticsearch, for example. So I simply wrote uh, APIs that I require uh, that were useful to me, and that's what you see here. So if let's say you want to search, um, we'll say index everything. Index. So let's say you want to search by a query. This API is called Meta Query. It basically takes a keyword called title, and it will take the title. And then you can give how many results you want, and then a match, exact match. So we're going to test it. There you go. So I got the entire thing. And I also, so if you work with Elasticsearch, uh, you get a lot of data back. So this API will cut that in short and give exactly the poem. If you want tags, you can search tags. Uh, pretty straightforward. A nice thing about Elasticsearch is uh, if, you're, uh, if you have semantic content, like in my case, with poetry and you know, literary fiction, you can have analyzers, custom analyzers configured in uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, there are about eight of them. You can also have composed different analyzers. In my case, I used a stemming analyzer and gave a bunch of parameters. And I worked till I got what I wanted and then created a simple wrapper. So you can see here, 
if I search for after a week of physical as, an ex as a phrase, I do, get it I do get some results back. But what if I'm searching for something like after week physical, which means the, the nouns, the, you know, some things are missing. And this is a common thing that users would do. Still getting back. So these are some of the nice things that Elasticsearch provides. I, I believe Datomic uh, doesn't have at this point a uh, lot of semi analyzers. So if you're looking for content-based search, uh, I would recommend Elasticsearch at this point. And we also have, I also have a Datomic API. Um, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to show. But since it's not fully functional, it's not fair for me to show it. But the API is basically similar to Elasticsearch. You have a data connect and give the memory or dev, it will connect to uh, Datomic. You can load the schema by saying load schema. You can save a poem. In, uh, in my case, I had a schema. You can save a poem. And you can find by author's full name. And you can give a short URL with this UUID. In my case, I was trying to work with a URL shortener, which had a bug. So this is what you see. And uh, a really nice feature I came across recently is uh, you can link uh, ref. Uh, for example, if you have poems and annotations, if you have two parent-child relationships, from the UI, you don't know the business ID. You don't know the ID usually. So you can pass the annotation, pass the child object, and then refer to the parent using a tweet URL, for example. And Datomic will automatically link that. So that's there. And that's, that's pretty much the API. And the final publish API was it's a, it's a single line. Um, API publish will take any resource or URL or file, um, depending on where the poem is located. And it will index, it will validate, convert the text format to Zen, which is Eden. It will index in Elasticsearch. It will in, put it in uh, Datomic. And uh, hopefully, we're good to go. And it will also give you a nice URL that we can tweet about it. So that was the goal, that when this is out, uh, poets should be able to simply curate poems and put it out. Uh, we have just seen this. Um, for those who are interested in learning more about poetry, I have a whole slide that I can go through. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through it, and, but I'm open to questions. The reason that I had to go this route is because of taxonomy. That in po uh, things like poetry, there's a rich taxonomy, and each editor and each poet and scholar comes with their own. And they have a really good knowledge about what, how things work. And giving uh, a generic tool like CMS would, would, would not enable them to do this level of taxonomy. For example, in the screen you've seen before, the demo, uh, adding a tag, say, adding a command like tag and giving a tag name would be as simple as writing two functions. Uh, imagine doing this in any other framework. I could not have thought of building new features this way. So at this point, I am at a point where if, there is, if my editor comes and says, hey, I want this feature, it's basically looking at, OK, is it there in Elasticsearch? Is it there in Datomic? Is it there in my linguistics API? If not, let me add the wrapper. Then I come to ohm. I add the, a little command. And hopefully, it'll work. Uh, before, we had to do the entire thing. And I, f I feel there's a great benefit in uh, using Clojure, Clojure script in this case. So a bit about taxonomy, place, time, mood, and type are some of the ways you can classify poems. Place is continent, country, town, time is. There are so many times, and each one can go further. And uh, mood can be introspective to all the way to subversive and friendly conversational. And again, types can be very various classes. And even within the poem, I mentioned in the beginning that Page is consisted of words, synonyms, and semantic content. So when you start looking at poems, there are different kinds of poems. And we can now, at least what we have, we are now able to highlight that sections because we have the line numbers and the tokens in the data structure in ClojureScript, in the browser, and we can interact with these sections. It's a matter of adding a style sheet, for example, to show these kinds of poems. Anyone here uh, is into machine learning? I'm, I'm not into that. Uh, I tried to read it. Uh, I, didn't un <laughs> I tried to read it. I didn't understand. I, I don't think they carry taste. Uh, in my particular use case, I think it's a great uh, 
use case if you have one terabyte of data and you don't know what it is and you want to make money, that's a great way. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, when you don't, when you know what the content type is, I think machine learning is probably an overkill. Uh, that's what I found when I started to learn. Uh, they don't communicate. Uh, poets communicate, I think, and I think enabling poets with simple tools can can make uh, a great benefit to public schools and you know sharing poetry. Uh, it's another favorite quote of mine by Richard. So the roadmap, uh, I'd like to compose pages. I started with a page, and uh, I have a working concept of how to make a page interactive uh, and add features without, in a, few, in a matter of a day, less than a day. Uh, and we want to work with lit magazines, and there are a lot of them. Uh, that's the team. Uh, I couldn't have done this without the team. I wouldn't be standing here. My brother worked a lot on this. Uh, my friend, uh, poet professor Atta, had been constantly consulting on how, how the taxonomy works. Uh, he's been learning Python. I've been trying to teach Python to a poet. Uh, not that successful. <laughs> uh, this project, uh, everything but the services, is on Poetride. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, it's going to be an open source project. And once the services are a bit more mature, uh, I'd like to release some of that as well. Uh, there are way too many people I want to thank. Uh, I've tried my best to put it. I can't thank enough the core closure guys, uh, Chris Granger, Lighttable, Ohm, David Nolan, uh, the wonderful jQuery plugin community. And uh, there are a few design, uh, designers I admire, uh, grid.css. Um, the page you've seen, and I haven't covered responsive design, it's actually a responsive web design page. It is working in grids. Uh, the entire thing has a layout, which is separate from the page. Uh, I'm happy to show if anyone is interested in design. Um, I, I'm a new, new, new to design, but I'll be happy to show. But that page uh, was actually rendering in a responsive web design layout with the own page injected in it. Um, thanks to uh, Sean Groh, uh, my brother wanted to put this because he uh, got a few really solid answers from you guys, so thank you. And uh, I want to end with the slide. Uh, I want to ask you, what do you see? Perhaps it's a tough question. What do you see now? Perhaps we should start with assumptions, like most scientists and mathematicians. A boy, a field. A soaring eagle off screen. A boy in search of father. All of the above. But here's a conflict. We don't know the context. We don't know the values. We don't know the time. So let's try. Let's try it in Eden. Let's say we had this information. I want to read this out. Uh, this is one of my favorite lines in Datomic. And every line out there is poetry to me. And I just like to read Datomic docs, actually. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Rich Hickey writes this, but uh, I haven't talked to him. Uh, we don't erase our old memories in order to form new ones. It's likely we will look back at the last few decades as an unfortunate time. And computers kept us from doing the right thing. The time to change that is now. The gentleman in the center is uh, uh, Minsky. That's the AI at 50 McCarthy on the left. And uh, thank you.